All right, I am quite eager to preach the gospel to you this morning from Isaiah chapter 49. So I'd like to invite you to turn there with me. Isaiah 49. We're going to focus on verses 13 through 16, but I want to read a a larger section, so I'll begin reading in verse 8. This is Isaiah 49, beginning in verse 8. This is God's holy and authoritative word. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights, shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be too narrow for your inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. From where have these come? Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples. And they shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Father, we ask that you would Speak to us now. Edify your people through the preaching of your word. Feed us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's one of the great facts of life that we are always forgetting things. We're always leaving things behind, uh, even things that may matter to us. There was an interview with someone who works for the lost and found in, uh, in the airline Southwest, and 
He said in this interview that the sheer volume of items left behind on planes is just overwhelming. So they have these, uh, the, the, these warehouses where they keep all of these things. You walk in and there's just hundreds and hundreds of coats. Um, he said that they get crazy amounts of cell phones, iPads, iPods, laptops. In an interview, the man was saying he always finds it a bit sad because with each item that he looks at, he realizes that there was that moment where a passenger had that realization, wait, where is my wallet? Where is my phone? Where is my camera? You wouldn't believe, though, the things that have been left behind. This is on planes. What they do is they generally divide them into low-value and high-value items. But people have left behind, so this is on airplanes, a bag of diamonds, uh, a panda suit was left behind, a prosthetic leg, a parrot, so a guy, you know, gops in his Uber. He's like, wait, where's my parrot? He left it back on the plane. A beautiful double bass instrument. A glass eye was left on a plane. Dentures. A handwritten marriage proposal. A wedding dress. And more. It's part of the human condition. It's part of our weakness and frailty that we're always forgetting things. When my wife, Megan, leaves the house... If there's one thing that I'm supposed to do while she's gone, I'm good for it. But the moment it's, can you do this? Oh, and this. I have that look. She says, would you like me to write it down? I say, yes. Oh, we're going to have to get this down on paper because if it's more than one thing that needs to be done, I am going to be incapable of remembering it. We are so inclined to forgetfulness. And he, but here's the thing. We tend to think that God is like us. So that when troubles come into our lives, we wonder if we have been forgotten. We wonder if God has left us behind, if God has abandoned us. And I believe it is the heart of God today to minister to us through his word, to minister to those who wonder because of life circumstances. Has the Lord forgotten me? Has the Lord forgotten me? Verse 13 contains this uh, glorious call to praise God. It's a call there in verse 13 to praise God with songs of joy, with shouts of praise, because of what God has done for his people. In the first part of this chapter, we didn't read it from the beginning of the chapter, but we encounter the servant of the Lord. Uh, the servant as it appears in Isaiah, sometimes refers to the people of Israel, but at other times clearly refers to an individual who would come to redeem Israel from their trouble. And that's what we have here. Verse 5, just before what we read, says this servant was set apart by God in the womb to bring God's people back to himself. Verse 6 goes further and says that the servant will be a light for the nations, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. When verse 7 then says that he would be deeply despised and abhorred by many, it's pointing forward a preview of Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, speaking of the sufferings and the death of this servant through which he would win our salvation. And so when Jesus came into the world, and this first half of the chapter is all about Christ, beginning where we started reading in verse 8, when Jesus came into the world, he declared it to be, verse 8, the day of salvation. And verse 9 goes on to say that Jesus says to prisoners, come out. Jesus says to those who are in darkness, appear. Because we know before Christ came, we were bound in sin and darkness. We were without hope. We were imprisoned, lost in spiritual death. Christ died the death that we deserve to bring us back to God. And then on through the following verses, he promises to lead his people like sheep to good pasture so that, verse 10, they will not hunger and thirst for God will lead them. God will guide them. He will be our provision. He will be our protection at all times. 
And then verse 12 points forward to that great day when not simply the Jewish people would return to, from Babylon in where they were in exile, but points forward to a much greater day when the people of God would gather from every nation, from every tribe and tongue to praise the name of God for this great salvation that He has worked through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is no wonder that verse 13 at that point in the chapter, explodes with praise. Everyone is called to praise the name of God. There is worldwide joy because the worldwide Savior has come. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. O mountains, break into singing, for the Lord has comforted His people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Verse 13. And you know what the very next word is? But. But, verse 14. But, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. You might remember, if you're familiar with the, the chapters 40 and beyond of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet is addressing a future generation who would be held captive in Babylon, driven out of their own land as Zion lays in ruins. That's the audience that's in view here. The whole book of Lamentations captures just how devastating that moment was for the people of God. And it's in that moment that God addresses these people and says, Sing for joy. You know, we're, we're called to rejoice, and yet so often our circumstances seem to make that impossible. We feel like we have been abandoned by the very one who is calling us to rejoice. Sing for joy. And you may come on a Sunday morning and there's calls to worship, calls to sing the praises of God. We know our hearts ought to respond to the truth of the gospel. We know we have an obligation before the Lord to rejoice in His goodness, to delight in all He has done for us in Jesus Christ, and yet our hearts do not respond. And we say, if not to others, we say in our own hearts and in our minds, we wonder, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. It's this experience of abandonment. The feeling that he is distant from us. Do you remember the experience the toys had in the movie Toy Story 3? So at the beginning of the film, Andy's going off uh, to college. Uh, his toys are trying to get his attention. He's grown up. He's 17 years old. He's interested in other things now. They feel alone. This is the reason that the movie makes grown men cry. Uh, the, the movie, the, the, these toys feel neglected, they feel alone, they feel left behind, and the movie taps into that desire that we all have to be appreciated and to be loved. And so Woody and Buzz Lightyear and the others spend most of that film feeling forgotten and abandoned. That's what they're wrestling with, that exact experience. And then you remember they're accidentally donated to a daycare center, Sunnyside Daycare, where most of the toys there have stories of being forgotten and abandoned. And so Lotso, the big purple bear, takes them in. Of course, that works out really well. Won't give you any spoilers. Doesn't work out well. I want you to know that this is a common condition among the people of God. We experience the same sense of abandonment in our own lives. And listen, we should not be surprised by it. We should not be taken off guard by it. And it's a spiritual condition that cannot be treated simplistically. God's with you. Do your devotions. Cheer up. It's never as easy as saying God has not deserted you. Because... There are times when God does withdraw a sense of his presence from us. The Puritans actually talked about this. They talked about spiritual desertions. That was the language that they used. As an experience in the Christian life, we experience spiritual desertions. And that language is, in fact, drawn from just a few chapters later. In Isaiah 54, verses 7 and 8, it references those moments that we are deserted by God. 
God says, for a brief moment, I have deserted you. The, that, that loss of, of a sense of God's nearness. It's when we're spiritually deserted. It's when God hides his face from us. Our soul has no comfort in those moments, and we find ourselves at a place of despondency and a place of despair. I want to tell you about a woman named Amy and share with you some of her story. Amy vividly recalls her own moment of feeling abandoned. She remembers the night that she collapsed to her knees beside her bed, knowing her wedding ring had to come off. She says, that afternoon a judge had declared my divorce final. Through the demise of our marriage, though the demise of our marriage had appeared inevitable for a while, I hadn't stopped wearing my wedding ring, a symbol of my confidence that no matter how hopeless things looked, God could turn them around in an instant. But now here I was, 30 years later, kneeling alone by the side of my bed, sobbing. Recently, through this extended trial, she says she had been on the verge of complete mental, emotional, and physical collapse. She was, she was confused. She was greatly troubled by God allowing her life to be so excruciatingly painful. She describes it as a true spiritual crisis. And whether on that level or a smaller level, you may know your own moments of spiritual crisis in that way. And she said in that moment, as she describes that experience, where was this God I had been counting on? Was he real? If he was, did he care? She says in that moment beside her bed as she slipped off the ring, she said, I was in no shape to compose an articulate prayer. There was a lot of sobbing and groaning. When I could form words, I cried out. I could never watch someone I love suffer like this and not stop it. You say you love me, but I can't square that with what is happening. This feels cruel. I've got to know you are who you say you are, or I cannot go on. If God is a good and loving God, how do I square that with my experience? Where is God in the midst of this overwhelming difficulty that has come into my life? That's the experience of verse 14. The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. And friends, brothers and sisters, it can be any number of things that brings you there. Relational disappointments can bring you there. The loss of employment can bring us there. Serious illness in ourselves or in a family member, in a friend, in someone we love, can bring us there. The death of a family member or a friend can lead us to feel forgotten by God. When we experience injustice, when others sin against us, when unjust criticism comes, how often do we cry out, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. I wonder, even if it's not that strong of a cry, whether that resonates with your thoughts at all. At all. I wonder if there are any of you here today who you would say that, that the Lord seems far away from you. Perhaps your circumstances have tempted you to believe that the Lord has forgotten you. You feel like God is not attentive to your concerns. Perhaps you're experiencing your own spiritual desertion. God does not say, when you come to him, he doesn't say, I don't care about your circumstances, just block those out and sing for joy. Um, he, he doesn't rebuke us and deal harshly with his people in the midst of these struggles. Instead, what we see here is that he reasons with us he is gracious with us, and he reminds us of his love. And in fact, following that call to praise, but then Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. Following that are three pictures of compassion as reassurances that God has not forgotten. And so it's these three images that I want us to look at. The loving mother, the engraved hands, and the restored walls. Okay, first image is the loving mother. 
This is in verse 13, where in order to convince us of the depth of his affections for us, God compares his love for us, his love for you, with the love that a mother has for a nursing child. You know how much a mother is attached to a child. There's this remarkable bond of uh, a unique bond of dependence and affection. And in case you didn't know, it is true, uh, a father's, with fathers, it is a bit different. Uh, I'm not saying this to stereotype men. Uh, part of it is I'm stating the fact that children never draw their life from their father, either in the womb or after birth in nursing. So yes, uh, contrary to what a growing number of people in our culture will tell you, men and women are different. And here, God compares himself to a mother for a reason. Now, I was thinking about this. As a dad, my specialty is letting the baby cry. Like, those moments where the baby, I think we're just going to need to let the baby cry. I am here for that. Like, that's my fastball. I can let the baby cry. Every time I, I hold a baby, people ask me if it's my first time. Seriously, our sixth child, I'm in the house. People are like, you have other kids, right? The nurse asks me, like, you're going to want to hold the baby a little closer. Well, you know, I'm doing what I can here. And yes, I've had kids before. Um, you know, my, my gift is helping the toddler who falls down learn that it's not that big of a deal by ignoring him. I can do that. If my kids know where the first aid kit is, they can take care of themselves, right? A mother's heart, a mother's heart is full of tenderness and compassion. Can a mother forget? Can a mother have no compassion? It is generally the case that mothers will not abandon and forget their children. But you may wonder, well, what about mothers who fail? What about mothers who, who fail to nourish their children or who abuse their children? So God adds that mothers may forget, but with God it is impossible. Even these may forget, he says, yet I will not forget you. In other words, God's attachment to us is not equal to the mother-baby relationship. It is far greater. God wants us to meditate on the very best of a mother's love and then consider your father in heaven has a love for you that is even stronger and more reliable. The greatest of earthly loves may cease and fail, but God's love for us will never fail. We may, we may be deserted for a time, but we are not rejected. We are not forgotten. As God's children, it's true, we are often disciplined, but we are never abandoned. And there may be times when a loving mother will let a baby cry, or when a mother might be out of sight. It's at those times that babies can sometimes feel like it's the end of the world as they lay and they wail. But it'd be wrong for the baby to conclude that the mother has forgotten and forsaken. You know, babies are sometimes slow to learn that the mother always hears, the mother always returns eventually, the mother is not gone for good. What happens in moments of unbelief in our hearts is not that God has forgotten us, but that we have forgotten his character, and we have forgotten his goodness and his faithfulness in Christ. That's the first image, the loving mother. Image number two, the engraved hands. Verse 16, the Lord says to us, and you sing this in songs, and I'm sure you're familiar with this imagery. It is from this chapter of Isaiah. Verse 16, behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. So the first image of the loving mother communicates something of the depth and the strength of God's love. Here, this image communicates the permanence of that love that God has for us. Ordinarily, in ancient culture, in Isaiah's day, what you would have is that the master's name was written on the servant's hand. Um, so that the servant never forgets who he belongs to. Here, beautifully, it is reversed. It is the master who writes our names, the names of wretched sinners like you and me, upon his hand. 
And he wants us to see this image. He says, behold. That behold is a word calling us to look and see. So it's as if Isaiah wants us to see, even now through the eyes of faith, to see the hands of God held out for us. And what you see there upon his hand is your name written upon that sovereign loving hand. We see our name there engraved upon his hands. Engraved as if written on stone, etched into the skin. This is not a removable tattoo that rubs off in a few days. This is not writing with invisible ink or with Crayola's washable markers. It is engraving. And here's something else. On this side of the cross, we have the confidence of knowing that our names are written on the hands that were pierced for us. You may remember in John chapter 20, in verse 20 of that chapter, when Jesus showed his disciples his hands and his side, it was as if he said, behold, see. And so he comes to us and does the same. Behold, see the hands that were pierced on that rugged cross. Look upon those hands and see your name written in love, never to be removed. This is a glorious statement of the permanence of the love of God for you. The cross is the pulpit of God's love. The cross stands as a reminder that God will not forget you. He wouldn't give His own Son for your salvation only to forget the details of your life. When we feel forsaken, we can remember that Christ was forsaken by God. That he bore the wrath that we deserve. He was forsaken that we might be welcomed. He was condemned so that we might be accepted. He was cast out so that we might be brought near. His hands were pierced so that our names might be forever written on his hands. It's at that point that Charles Wesley breaks out in song, speaking to his own soul and says, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Christian, know today that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. The greatest trial, the greatest difficulty, the greatest hardship, the greatest sorrow that you may know. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. You have it on the authority of God himself. He will not forget his own. He will love and keep you till the end. Behold the engraved hands with your name and mine written upon them. Image number three for the comfort of our souls. The restored walls. The restored walls. The second part of verse 16 Uh, might not appear immediately encouraging to us, but I've got something glorious for you here. All right, second part of verse 16 there, you see the Lord says, for the comfort and encouragement of our souls, your walls are continually before me. All right, your walls are continually before me. What does that mean? Well, remember the context here. Is this is an absolutely shocking statement for the Israelites in exile. Your walls, the walls of Jerusalem, the beloved city, your walls are continually before me. Now here's the most important thing you need to know about the walls God's referring to at the time he was addressing these people. The walls were in ruins. They were not standing. Babylon had destroyed those walls of Jerusalem and taken the people captive. And the sorrow and the agony of that destruction was unbearable for the people of God. They looked upon the ruins of their hopes, the destructions of their dreams, the loss of their sense of identity and their joy, and they wept bitterly as the people of God. And God comes to them in their sorrow, in their despair, and says, 
your walls are continually before me. To which they say, God, what walls? I don't see walls. I see wreckage. I see ruins. I see the mess that is my life. And these ruins seem to be the proof that you don't care. God, if you were with us, the walls would be standing. If you hadn't forgotten me, things wouldn't be this way. What walls? But God says to us in the midst of our misery, my child, where you see ruins, I see walls. Where you see ruins in your life, God sees walls. Those places of your life that you think are the proof of divine abandonment are seen by your God in a totally different way. That God sees walls is a statement of his future purpose for his people. He's doing something. God brings blessing out of the rubble of our lives. God delights to use the ruins of sin and failure and suffering to make masterpieces for his glory. From these ashes, he makes beauty in this Suffering, your suffering, there is purpose. Your walls are continually before the Lord and there is nothing in all the earth that can thwart the good and loving purposes that your God has for you. He sees walls. Joseph saw one hardship after another. You remember at the end of Genesis, he's thrown into a pit, he's sold into slavery. But all along, God saw walls. Naomi was destitute and abandoned, having lost those closest to her. But God saw walls. He had a glorious plan of redemption. Simon Peter failed miserably in denying Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. But God saw walls and said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. He is a God of restoration. He is a God who gives us a future. He is the God of hope. Your walls are continually before me. You know, one of the things that I hate about Satan is that he's always pointing to the ruins. He would have us wallow in misery and hopelessness. He brings accusation. He seeks to condemn. He says, you will never change. Things will never get better. There is no hope for you. But friends, God looks at you today and he says, I look at your life and I see walls. Alan Redpath says, if someone feels in his heart the situation is hopeless, and I know that for some there is some situation that in your heart seems hopeless this morning. If someone feels in his heart the situation is hopeless, I say you are looking at the ruins of life while God looks at the walls. You look at what you have been, and you are conscious of awful failure, but bless the Lord, He sees you in Christ as what He intends you to be. He sees you as what you long to be in your best moments. He sees you as what you will be when the grace of God has finished the task. This is who our God is. God is the master architect whose plans for us are ever before him. The restored walls are the promise of a better future for the people of God. That's what God goes on to say in the rest of Isaiah 49. That's why I wanted to read a significant section of that. God says to his people, a day is coming when you will be amazed by your fruitfulness. And God promises to surprise us with the expansion and the growth of his church. In verse 20, so many are added to the people of God, there's not enough room for them all. You know, it's it's often the case, you need to know this about life in the church, it is often the case that the church of Christ in this world feels small and helpless. One hymn says, with a scornful wonder, men see the church sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. The church is messy, full of toil and tribulation, and that is 
exactly why people are so often tempted to give up on it when we see ruins, when we see wreckage. But God comes to us and says, it will not always be this way. Your walls are continually before me. And what hope is here for the people of God in every generation? Because the people of God have often thought that their generation would be the last. We had thought that the glorious work God had done in our generation would fade and die. We had feared that the work of our hands would be in vain. But God promises that from the barrenness, from the weakness, from the ruins of his people, even from us, will come forth a people, a new generation, who will yet praise the name of our God. This is what God is doing in the youth. This is what God is doing in the children. He has a future for His church, and it is a purpose and a future that He will not abandon. The mother in verse 21 says, I was left alone. From where did these children come? This growth, looking around and seeing all of this expansive growth. Where will the future abundance of the church come from? How can it be explained? Not by Zion's gifting or skill. Not by Zion's wisdom. Not because the people of God earned it. Not because we have something really great going on in our church, in our denomination. Rather, the growth of the people of God and the restoration of the church is dependent entirely upon the gracious promise of our God. And in all the verses 17 through 26, God says to the church, those who oppose you and seek your failure will be gone and your children will be more than you can imagine. And so we know as the people of Christ, God is even now purifying a people for his own possession. He gave his son so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. I want to close by returning back to Amy's story. I told you about Amy earlier. The day that the judge declared the divorce final was that night that she slipped the ring off of her finger. And in the midst of great sorrow, in fact, that night, she says that she was at a much different place than she had been before in the height of her crisis. In fact, that night, she says, I was unable to contain my gratitude for God's persistent love through a mess that should have driven him away. She says, instead, he came closer than ever. And Amy, in that moment, slipped off her ring and she prayed a prayer. She said, God, she said, God, now I want to give you the devotion I thought I would be giving to an earthly husband. And she said that while something in her was dying, something else was coming to life. She said, I have been changed by the experience of this unstoppable love constantly moving toward me when I was coming to him with nothing to offer but weakness, confusion, and need. And she says that as she got up off of her knees, she had a thought, I should get myself a new ring to remind me of this vow that I've made to the Lord tonight. The next morning, Amy met with a group of women she regularly prays with. Uh, during the opening time of silence before that, that prayer meeting with those ladies in the church, one of the ladies came over and took off a ring and held it out and said, I feel like the Lord wants you to have this ring. He wants you to know that you are his beloved and he is betrothing himself to you for the rest of your life. He will be your protector and provider. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will be with you forever. And Amy says, the ring she handed me was much more beautiful and valuable than any ring I would have gotten myself. I had mentioned nothing about getting a new ring. And she says, I can't tell you how many times in the years since a glance at that ring has calmed my fear, filled my loneliness, and comforted me in grief. And then she says this, I wanted a ring to remind me of my commitment to the Lord. Instead, I ended up with one that will forever remind me of his commitment to me. 
God has given us these three pictures, church. These pictures as a reminder of his commitment to us. So that in moments of darkness, in the midst of our fear and loneliness and grief, when it seems as though God has forgotten, we would remember in our hearts, we would take these images with us, the loving mother, the engraved hands, and the restored walls. And that we would rest our troubled souls in the security of his steadfast love and in his wise sovereign plan for our lives. He loves you. Your name is written on his hands. And I can assure you, his good and loving purposes for you will not fail. Let's pray.